Schönen guten Abend, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Ich freue mich, hier Ihnen heute zu unserem Montagsvortrag einen ganz besonderen Vortrag ankündigen zu dürfen. Wie Sie sehen, sind wir mit diesem Vortrag wieder im ähm, digitalen Format. Das ist einfach der vierten Welle der Pandemie geschuldet. Es war uns hier doch jetzt etwas ähm, zu unsicher, hier große Mengen in unseren Hörsaal im Landesamt für Denkmalpflege ähm, zu, äh, äh, zu empfangen. Und so machen wir dieses Videoformat. Das hat sich ja bewährt. Seit ungefähr für einem Jahr bieten wir das an und der große Vorteil ist natürlich, dass das viele Menschen sehen können, die sonst gar nicht hierher hätten herkommen können. Ich ähm, möchte Ihnen heute unsere Referentin kurz vorstellen. Dr. Annemieke Milks ist eine der bedeutendsten Forscherinnen, größten Expertinnen auf dem Gebiet der steinzeitlichen Waffenkunde sozusagen. Ihr Spezialgebiet ist Subsistenzwirtschaft in, in der Altsteinzeit. Sie kennt sich wie keine andere auch aus mit Waffen. Und deswegen sind wir sehr froh, dass wir sie gewinnen konnten für unser Projekt bei der Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft unter Leitung von Professor Terberger hier im Haus. Ein Projekt, das sich mit der Analyse und der, der, der Entschlüsselung der Schöninger Speere im Wesentlichen beschäftigt, die ja in dem Museum in Schöningen ausgestellt sind. Frau Milks konnten wir abwerben sozusagen beim University College in London. Annemieke Milks ist Amerikanerin niederländischer Herkunft, die äh, jetzt seit vielen Jahren in Großbritannien lebt. Sie hat sich immer schon mit Holz beschäftigt. Sie war nämlich oder ist eine äh, durchaus ähm, äh, sehr bekannte Violinistin, die in berühmten äh, Sinfonieorchestern gearbeitet hat, bis eine Verletzung ihr dieses äh, Violinspiel auf dem hohen Niveau unmöglich machte. Und dann hat sie sich entschlossen, Archäologin zu werden, hat sehr straight ähm, Archäologie studiert in den USA und in England und hat schließlich ihre Dissertation geschrieben über genau dieses Thema, was sie hier nun zur Spezialistin für das Schöningen-Projekt gemacht hat, nämlich ähm, die, die Frage der der Analyse von Holzartefakten hat sich zum Beispiel auch vorher schon mit deutschen Holzartefakten beschäftigt, wie Lehringen, auch Schöningen äh, kennt sie, kannte sie vorher schon, hat sie in ihrer Dissertation bearbeitet, Kleckten und so weiter, diese frühen Artefakte. Das, was ihre Forschungsarbeit auszeichnet, ist nicht nur, dass sie die Stücke beschreibt und sagt, da gibt es Speere und die sind 2,20 Meter lang, sondern dass sie die ganzen Dinge sehr hochauflösend beschreibt. Das ist das, was jetzt auch in unserem Forschungsprojekt hier passiert aber auch Aspekte der experimentellen Archäologie mit drin hat. Und zwar nicht einfach ein alter weißer Mann sitzt am Schreibtisch und überlegt, wie der Speer geflogen ist, sondern sie ähm, hat wirklich mit, äh, in Experimenten zusammen auch mit Spezialisten für Waffentechnik zusammengearbeitet, mit Sportlern. Da werden zum Beispiel in diesen Experimenten Dinge wie Body Mass Index, sie wird Ihnen das sicher alles gleich noch sagen, ähm, berücksichtigt. Und was auch ganz wichtig ist für dieses Thema, wir haben ja hier, reden ja hier in Schöningen von einem Zeitraum von vor 300.000 Jahren. Dieses Projekt basiert ja auf dieser Fundstelle von Schöningen, die beim Braunkohletagebau entdeckt worden ist, in 10 bis 15 Meter Tiefe unter der heutigen Oberfläche freigelegt durch den Schaufelradbagger. Und diese Fundstelle ist eben deswegen so spektakulär, weil dort organisches Material so hervorragend erhalten ist. In diesem Schöningen-Projekt ähm, ähm, ist, ist das typisch für unsere altsteinzeitlichen Fundstellen. Wir haben keine Schriftquellen. Wir wissen nicht, was die Menschen damals gedacht, äh, gelebt haben. Wir, wir wissen einfach nur, wir müssen dort detektivisch die Spuren analysieren. Und da spielt diese Fundstelle von Schöning eine Schlüsselrolle. Und dann guckt man natürlich sehr gerne auch in die Ethnologie. Und das ist auch etwas, Frau Milks ist auch beteiligt an ethnologischen Projekten, zum Beispiel im Kongo in Afrika, wo ähm, heutige ähm, ähm, Jagd, Jägergruppen, äh, Gruppen von Jägerinnen und Jägern, dann, äh, dort zeigen, wie sie, wie sie mit diesen Speeren unterwegs sind, aber auch zum Beispiel, wie, wie eine Ausbildung an dieser Waffe äh, entsteht, äh, wie, 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 wie Kinder auch an diese äh, Jagd herangeführt werden. Und das ist auch noch mal ein besonderes Thema, das ich Ihnen sehr empfehlen möchte. Äh, Frau Milks hat auch einige Publikationen zum Thema Kind in der 
Altsteinzeit gemacht und das ist sehr, sehr spannend. Wir möchten jetzt eigentlich, sind wir auch ein bisschen traurig, weil Frau Milks uns wieder verlassen wird. Sie hat nämlich ein ganz eine ganz tolle Forscherstelle gekriegt, äh, finanziert von der Britischen Akademie der Wissenschaften an der ähm, Universität Reading, dem äh, Archäologischen Institut der Universität Reading. Das Schöne für uns ist, sie wird diesem Projekt aber ähm, erhalten bleiben. Wir werden mit ihr nach wie vor eng zusammenarbeiten. Ihr Forschungsschwerpunkt wird natürlich nach wie vor die äh, Untersuchung von Holzartefakten sein. Und wir freuen uns schon auf viele gemeinsame weitere Studien hier jetzt gerade in ihrer Zeit in Deutschland hat sie einen großen äh, Fragenkatalog abgearbeitet, einen Aufnahmekatalog für diese Holzartefakte und ganz hinreißende neue Ergebnisse schon generiert. Und äh, jetzt freue ich mich auf einen spannenden Vortrag. Ähm, liebe Annemeke, die Annemeke, please uh, give us our, uh, your lecture. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to speak today about the site of Schöningen with its exceptional record of wooden spears alongside other tools made of wood, bone, and stone, butchered animals, and so much more. It's no exaggeration to say that there are few archaeological sites that compare to Schöningen in its ability to help us understand human evolution. So having completed a PhD on wooden spears and their significance, I have been lucky enough to join the team here in Hanover to work on the wood from the so-called spear horizon. Today, I will introduce the site itself, and then I will share some ethnographic and experimental work that uh, has helped to expand our ability to interpret these earliest uh, weapons and the site of Schöningen, these technologies behind Uh, early human hunting. I will end by sharing some of what our team has been working on here, uh, recording in detail both the spears as well as many additional wooden artifacts from the site. So Schöningen is an archaeological site located in the district of Helmstedt in Lower Saxony in Germany. And near the site lies the Elm, which is a range of limestone hills that is today a beech forest. The famous spears came from the site shining in 13-2, with additional Pleistocene sites that have yielded important finds that tell us about humans and animals and environments over a long period of time. So shining in 13-2 itself and the spear horizon within it dates to approximately 300,000 years ago. Although no human remains have yet been found at the site, we can broadly compare this with other Eurasian sites and suggest that it was probably either uh, Homo heidelbergensis or very early Neanderthals. Schöningen as a site was first discovered by the archaeologist Hartmut Thieme in the 1980s who conducted rescue excavations along the edge of a brown coal mine. And it was under Tima's uh, excavations that the finds of the sp first spears and other wooden tools, butchered animals, and stone tools were first discovered. Tima's discovery was extraordinary, particularly as at the time there was significant debate as to whether hominins during this period were capable of hunting their prey or were behaving as scavengers of other carnivore kills. So the discovery of the spears helped to make sense of the archeological record. Other sites were suggesting that humans in Europe at this time were hunting the animals that they were eating, but the spears provided clear proof. So today, excavations of different localities at Schöningen are ongoing. Uh, with further exciting recent discoveries, including the remains of an elephant and a second double-pointed uh, wooden stick. The mine is now finished in terms of, of being used as, exploited as a coal mine, uh, and it's now filling with water, a process which I'm told will take as long as 100 years. There are as many as 10 spears already identified 
both complete spears and some which are more fragmented. And most of these are conserved and are now on display at the Forschungsmuseum in Schöningen. Now there are some important features of these tools, many of which were first recognized by Hartmut Thieme himself, as well as by Werner Schoch, who undertook an analysis of these and other wooden artifacts in previous years. So first, all of the spears taper to points at both ends. The tool marks and other features on both points show that in all cases, both the front and the backs were clearly worked. So the back tapers are not a natural feature of the tree, but rather were shaped this way by the humans who were making the spears. Tima also recognized that for at least some of the spears, the point of balance was likely to be in the front third or at least the front half of these spears um, based on where this, their maximum diameter was located. So these features were really important because they suggest that at least some of these spears were designed to be thrown. And I should clarify that in English, we use the term spear to mean all spears, whether they were thrown by hand or whether they were thrust as stabbing spears. I know in German there are different terms. Spear is a, more like a javelin and a lance for a thrusting spear. So when I speak about spears today, I'm talking about both types of uses. So and the, back to the, the, these features of why it was important that these might have been throwing weapons, um, this was also important because there was debate and still is debate about when humans started to throw in human evolution. And so these spears not only provided really nice evidence of human hunting, but they also suggested that humans were throwing these weapons at prey as early as 300,000 years ago. So in addition to the spears, Tima had discovered a much shorter stick, also with two shaped points. He interpreted this tool as a throwing stick, and a second one has been found and published more recently by the current excavation team. These tools are also important because they show us that at Schöningen there were probably many different tool types made from wood. And since wood rarely preserves in Paleolithic sites, this gives us really valuable insights into hunting technologies and also the ways in which they were manufacturing these tools. The spears are made from the trunks of spruce and pine trees. And so what is interesting is that at the site, the pollen record, suggests that these trees were not growing at the site itself, at the, the lake shore. The trees used for the spears were also growing very slowly due to poor growing conditions. Now the spear horizon itself formed at the end of an interglacial period when temperatures were dropping. And so this, these slow grown trees likely ref reflected this cold environment. One possibility for where the trees for the spears were cut is the Harz Mountains, some 50 kilometers distance from Schöningen. However, as you can see in this photo, there are some smaller trees which sometimes grow in the vicinity of larger trees. Uh, and these smaller trees will struggle for light and nutrients when they're competing with larger trees. And they also will grow more slowly and have denser wood. So there are a couple of possibilities for, for where the, the trees came from and sort of what the growing conditions might have been to lead to such dense and hard, slow-grown wood. The spear horizon formed along what was a lake shore. The wooden artifacts the preserved were left along this lake shore and the wet conditions led to them being preserved. This is important for us to understand both the condition of the wood and the marks and breaks that we see on the spears and the other wooden artifacts from the site. But it also helps us understand the site as a place that was repeatedly visited by both humans and animals. So a lot of research on the, the animal bones, the butchered animal bones from the site show us that these were repeated visits uh, over a period of time rather than one big uh, event. 
In this context, we can understand why humans repeatedly used this site for hunting and for butchering their prey. And also, they were possibly foraging for plant foods at this site. However, it was not likely the place where they were living. The locations of the spears and other wood artifacts maps onto this former lakeshore. So you can see that they are concentrated within a sort of strip of what was probably the edge of the lake. Wet enough to preserve this wood, but not so deep as to be out of the range of the humans. And in some cases, we have only fragments of spears and other tools. And in total, there are not just the complete and fragmented spears, but also hundreds and hundreds of additional wood fragments of spruce, pine, and larch, many of which show signs of working by human hands. And then there are other wood fragments uh, of other wood species that are probably natural background wood. At the site, there are the bones of many different types of animals. So in general, most of the bones that show marks from butchering by humans belong to an extinct species of horse. But humans also butchered other animals at the site, uh, including red deer, oryx, and bison. So from this, we get a picture that humans were hunting large prey at, at Schöningen, um, although we do have from other contemporary sites elsewhere in Europe, we have examples of Neanderthals likely hunting smaller prey, possibly um, aquatic species, or at least if not hunting them, then exploiting them in some way. So at Schöningen, we have this picture of, of large game hunting, um, but we, had, we should think about the capabilities of these tools to hunt other types of prey, including water, species that live in the water, um, and, and um, birds, etc. The Spear Horizon also showed that saber-toothed cats were present at the lake, as well as beaver. So beaver are particularly important to pay attention to because they have, may have contributed to the formation of the lake, and we need to recognize when wood was chewed by beaver rather than worked by humans. And there is some evidence of beaver chewed wood at the site as well as the beaver themselves. Now the presence of saber-toothed cat um, remains also shows us that spears would have been important for humans to protect themselves from other apex predators. So this is a, another, it's actually another species of saber-tooth in, in, on the slide but the, the species that was found at Schoeningen is called Homotherium latidens, and uh, a very large and dangerous uh, animal. So in an area dated earlier than the Spear Horizon, excavators have also found the remains of an elephant, which could have died there naturally. So I had some research questions um, from my PhD and subsequent to the PhD uh, that I wanted to sort of um, kind of expand upon what we could interpret about these spheres and the context of their use in human evolution. So for example, I wanted to ask the questions about whether these spears were used for throwing at animals. As I mentioned, this interpretation that at least some of them were throwing weapons, or for were they stabbing weapons uh, for, for using uh, as contact weapons uh, for prey or for both. So th this was important because there's a difference between getting absolutely right up close to a large and sometimes dangerous animal and having some a little, even a little bit of distance between oneself and these kinds of animals. So throwing may expand um, the ability to hunt with different strategies and different types of animals and it also improves safety uh, and, and how, how humans might have been hunting. So. Related to that question, I wanted to fill in some gaps in our knowledge about the ballistics of wooden spears when they were used as both thrusting weapons and throwing weapons. 
Relatedly, there were questions uh, by archaeologists about how accurate weapons are when they are thrown, spears, in particular wooden spears. The idea was that these were large and heavy and unwieldy weapons and that they were probably not particularly effective. So I wanted to um, explore that with a more scientific approach. And that finally, this idea that perhaps they were incapable of really wounding large prey enough to, to deal a, a, a lethal blow uh, to, to a large animal such as these horses that we see butchered at Schoeningen. So I'll just take a moment to explain some of the other archaeological evidence of wooden spears to give the context that it is not just at Schoeningen where we see these tools. We have three sites in uh, Europe which have this clear evidence of um, wooden spears. That is the site of Schoeningen which I'm talking about with you today. But there's also the earlier site of Clacton on Sea and the later Neanderthal site of Laringen. And I will talk about both of those in a little bit more detail. And all of these sites are attributed to, as a, like at Schoeningen, either Homo heidelbergensis or early Neanderthals. This is a subject which is um, undergoing a bit of debate at the moment. In addition to those sites attributed to Neanderthals or Homo halbrigensis, there are a couple of archaeological sites with evidence of wooden spears made by our own species. One of these is the site of Monteverde II in Chile, which is maybe somewhat controversially dated to about 14 and a half thousand years ago. And then there's a site um, called Weary Swamp in South Australia, which is dated to somewhere around 11,900 and 10,000 years ago. And this is also our own species, Homo sapiens. And at that site, um, there are quite a number of wooden artifacts, including the earliest uh, wooden boomerangs. So we see at that site, possibly again, another wetland site where humans were using wooden spears, possibly an early barbed wooden spear and boomerangs to hunt different types of animals in this sort of wetland environment. Now the Clacton Spear Point was discovered in the seaside town of Clacton-on-Sea in the United Kingdom by an amateur geologist, Samuel Hazeldean Warren, in 1911. So Warren had investigated deposits in the area over a period of time and really contributed quite a lot um, to what we now know about British um, paleo record. So he also discovered a type of stone tool technology uh, associated in the same deposits, which is known as the Clactonian, uh, as well as animal remains, most likely dating to the interglacial period of around 400,000 years ago. Warren discovered the Clacton Spear Point eroding out of freshwater deposits in the cliffs on the seashore. Uh, and although it is broken, the most likely interpretation of this tool is that it is a broken tip of a wooden spear. Now this object um, has undergone various interpretations. I mentioned earlier that we have had debates um, in the past of whether or not humans were capable of hunting or whether they were scavengers. And in the heat of this debate of hunting and scavenging, it was suggested that perhaps this tool was used as a probe to locate frozen carcasses under the snow, um, or possibly the, 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 this was a, even a game stake, which is a tool which is known to, to use, be used uh, for hunting as well. So, but at the moment, um, I do think the best interpretation is that this is the, the broken tip of a wooden spear. Uh, it is unfortunately difficult to interpret because it's a single find and it is broken. But the most likely date for these interglacial deposits is um, about 400,000 
years ago. And so this is potentially even earlier evidence than shining in of, of hunting with wooden spears. So this spear is made of yew wood, which is a wood that is both strong and elastic. Uh, and interestingly, it's, yew is a, a wood that has, is known to be used uh, quite a lot for weaponry throughout human um, evolution and in, more, in historic times. And it is very interesting to consider the possibilities that already 400,000 years ago, humans might have been choosing the wood uh, available that was available to them that best fitted their needs for the tool. So this is very exciting, I think, and interesting to consider the possibility of selection of materials already uh, 400 to 300,000 years ago. Tools associated with the Clactonian include flake tools and a type of tool called the Clactonian notch, which has been suggested to have been designed specifically for woodworking. And we do have um, stone tools uh, throughout uh, both Europe and Africa, which have evidence of having been used for woodworking. So although we rarely see these wood tools preserve, I think we have nice hints that uh, we humans were probably working wood quite a lot for their tools. So jumping far forward in time is the Neanderthal site of Laringen, which is interestingly also in Lower Saxony in Germany. Um, so the wooden spear from Laringen, often called the Laringen Lance, was discovered in 1948 as a result of dredging a marl pit for fertilizer. The deposits uh, are from a former lake basin and they would date to approximately 120,000 years ago to another warm period um, and it was probably quite a forested environment. The spear was found together with the remains of a straight tusked elephant and some stone tools. And like Clacton, the Laringen spear is made of yew and bears some beautiful tool marks across the surface, as you can see in my microscopic image here. In comparison with the Schoeningen spears, its length is within their range. It's at 2.4 meters long, but it is quite thin. Since the back does not taper and the maximum diameter is also near the back of the spear, it is interpreted as a thrusting spear. Although we can see that Pleistocene humans were making and using wooden spears and later tipped them with stone and other materials, there were still many things that were not very well understood about how humans made and used these weapons through time. For example, many archaeologists and anthropologists felt that wooden spears would not be effective when thrown at prey, as I mentioned, since they were considered to be heavy and difficult to throw. Another idea was that spears are only really effective when they're used to hunt large animals and that they weren't especially useful for hunting smaller game. So these ideas partly came from the archeological record suggesting that Neanderthals were focusing on hunting large animals, but some of these ideas also came from ethnographic studies. I wanted to explore these ideas in more detail particularly as there were clear records of recent societies such as the indigenous Tiwi and Tasmanians who only used wooden spears for hunting in absence of what we would consider more uh, sophisticated or complex weapons such as bow and arrow technologies or stone tip spears. So I looked at a wide range of ethnographic and ethnohistoric accounts of the use in, of wooden spears and I found evidence that they continue to be used by our own species, supporting the archeological evidence that I mentioned um, for hunting, for fishing, and for human violence. So this map shows um, the locations of those, uh, those groups who used wooden spears for these various reasons. Um, there are almost certainly more examples um, that are missing from this overview, but I think it starts to give us a picture that this is not a technology that was simple, ineffective, and um, 
was dropped in favor of these more sophisticated technologies that came later. So we had a puzzle, because if these wooden spears are not effective, you know, then, then we would assume that they would, be, would have been dropped. We needed to explore this in a lot more detail. So I looked in detail at these locations and the groups who were using wooden spears for hunting land animals, and this is what I focus on in this image. You can see that recently, humans have used wooden spears to hunt large and dangerous animals such as bear and jaguar, as well as docile animals like the capybara. And some of these animals also move very quickly, uh, like the emu and the forest kangaroo. I also found that humans will use wooden spears to hunt aquatic animals, such as the dugong, and for fishing too. So these are used in many different environments, including uh, arid deserts, open grasslands, and dense rainforests. And there didn't seem to be any particular prey type or environment in which wooden spears were not recorded to be used. And although they are rare in comparison to other weapon types, I think this helps to expand our idea of what the technology itself is capable of. What is also important to note is that ethnographically, humans used wooden spears to hunt alone, as well as in large communal group hunts. So again, there's a, an idea that Neanderthals and their predecessors, when they were hunting, were probably hunting in groups. Um, and although that is almost certainly the case, we also should consider the possibility that the technology supports the idea of hunting uh, alone or in groups of two or three humans. Recently, humans would hunt prey as small as beaver and possibly as large as forest elephants. Um, and they use tactics like pursuit, ambush, and disadvantage hunting. So again, this tells us that wooden spears are a technology suited to many different ways of hunting and with a whole range of different prey sizes. So rather than just seeing them as tools that are adaptable to large prey with communal hunting, we can consider um, small prey, single hunting, hunting in, in many different types of environments. I mentioned the question about distance and the issues with improving your distance between yourself and the animals that you're hunting. And in many cases, uh, particularly if you're not using something like a trap, uh, you, you might really appreciate a bit more distance between yourself and that animal. Now, there, were, there was the idea that spears thrown by hand were only really effective at very close distances of five to 10 meters. Now, there are absolutely examples in the ethnographic literature of hunting at these close distances with throwing spears. But what was interesting when I looked in the literature in more detail is that there are many examples also of hunting with throwing spears or in, indeed human violence um, with throwing spears at significant distances in comparison to five to 10 meters, as many as almost 45 to 50 meters in some cases. So this really led to the idea that we had to um, do some experimental work to better understand um, what, what the distances uh, were with these throwing spears and uh, what accuracy might look like um, with these spears. So rather than um, using ourselves, anthropologists and archeologists who are not particularly probably good at throwing and probably not in the best um, shape that we might like to be, um, I decided to do an experiment using javelin athletes. So we had six male javelin athletes of a club level, so this is not the elite level, but a club level javelin athletes in the United Kingdom at Loughborough University, and we made replicas of Shining and Spear 2. And I chose Shining and Spear 2 for all of the experiments that I'll talk about today so that we had something to directly to compare each experiment with. 
And we chose Spear 2 to replicate because it's the average, it sort of sits in the middle of this sample of spears at Schöningen. Um, their length, the length of the spears at Schöningen ranges from about 1.8 to over two and a half meters. So there is quite a bit of difference in the spears that we have. So we asked the javelin athletes to throw the spears at a series of distances at a hay bale at five meters, 10, 15, 20, and 25 meters. And we recorded these uh, both the release throws and the impacts with high-speed video cameras. And here you can see just a couple of images showing one of our athletes preparing to throw. It's obviously a skill um, and one which I myself do not have. And you can see that a really nice throw, um, the one image shows a really nice hit, and not all of the hits uh, to the target were quite so beautiful, but this is a really nice example, I think, of, of a good quality hit to the target. So we found um, roughly similar velocities to what we were expecting from the literature, uh, somewhere between 13.5 13 and, and 21 uh, meters per second. Uh, and these were specifically for the, the, those throws that were aimed at a target. We also asked them just to throw for distance to see how far they could throw. Uh, and because of the mass of the, the replicas, around 800 grams, which is very similar to a men's Olympic javelin, uh, the, the kinetic energy was reasonably high for these spears. And what you can see in the dark blue in this graph is um, the dark blue are the hits to the target and the light blue are the misses at each subsequent distance. So the first column is at five meters and then up to 25 meters. So you see at five meters, our javelin athletes hit the target at over 50% of the time, 58% of the time, and then by 25 meters, they didn't hit the target at all. So this was better than I was expecting in some uh, respects, but I was concerned uh, in a sense that javelin athletes are very good at throwing, but they throw for distance. They don't throw to hit a target. And this led to a research project with uh, my colleague, Dr. Shana Lovelevy, um, to work with the Bayaka foragers in the Republic of Congo. So the Bayaka foragers um, live in the rainforest uh, and they do hunt with spears uh, alongside trapping. And this is how the Bayaka men do the majority of their hunting. The Bayaka do hunt with guns, but they borrow the guns from the nearby Bandungo farmers. And any meat that they kill with the guns goes to the Bandungo. And so they rent the, the guns from the Bandango and that meat goes to them. So the spear hunting is still the way in which they hunt their own meat for themselves. They both throw and thrust their spears at prey. They throw at short distances because they are in a rainforest setting. And they hunt animals like brush-tailed porcupine and blue docker. Historically, um, elephants were also hunted, but we don't have any uh, elephant hunters in the study sample that we worked with. Now, Shana Lavlevi's side of the research project is also to understand how children learn to hunt, and children do start to play and play with um, wooden spears from as early as three years old, and there are a lot of games, and children, adolescents, will go hunting in groups, in peer groups, um, to hunt small prey, and then as they get older in adolescence, they will start to do hunting um, forays with adults. So, as I mentioned, we wanted to better understand many things about spear hunting, um, and because javelin athletes don't train to hunt with spears and hit a target, we suspected that the bayaka could throw more accurately, at least at the shorter distances with which they're used to throwing. So spears are embedded in their society, and we have had so much to learn from the Bayaka about spear hunting. We had 50 male adolescents and adults volunteer for this study, which is an incredible um, group of people. Um, we did not limit it to males, but only males volunteered to throw. 
Uh, and we set up our experiment similar to the one that we did with the javelin athletes, um, but we let them use their own spears with which they're used to hunting. Uh, the neighboring Bondongo farmers who also hunt with spears, um, some of these also joined in our study. Now we captured their, their throws at a target set at different distances, again using high-speed video cameras and a radar gun. So we're still working through these results and they are preliminary, but I can share a few snapshots already of that. So first, at least at the shorter distances, the Bayaka and Bondongo throwings, throwers far outperformed our javelin athletes. Uh, we suspect this is because this skill is learned over a lifetime. Spear throwing and spear hunting are complex skills uh, that take many, many years to perfect and practice. So the orange color in this graph shows the hits uh, and the blue shows the misses at distances of 5, 10, 15, and 20 meters. And the importance for this is that we can understand spear hunting in the deep past was also likely to be a key skill that would have been socially learnt and practiced over many, many years. I also wanted to understand the wounding capabilities of wooden spears, and so um, we conducted both uh, thrusting and throwing experiments using um, horse carcasses and um, wooden spear replicas and uh, for the thrusting experiment, we involved two um, male participants who are skilled in martial arts. We found with the spear thrusting experiment that although some uh, of the spears failed to penetrate um, at all, uh, there, are, there were certainly examples um, which penetrated far beyond what would be needed to, to kill an animal. So as a thrusting spear, these are effective tools. The throwing experiment, we did not use human participants. We used seven replicas of spear two, um, all weighted exactly the same by adding lead sheeting, as you can see my engineering colleague doing here. And then again, we captured with high-speed video and we fired these replicas from an air cannon. And all of this work was done at the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom in uh, Shrivenham. And um, unlike the thrusting experiment, which I should have mentioned didn't leave any marks on the bones, um, the throwing experiment again um, was capable of lethal um, lethal wounds, although again, not always, not every throw, but certainly some of the throws. And it, in some cases, it did leave some marks to the bones. But in general, what we're seeing, I think, is that wooden spears are capable of killing a large animal, but we're probably not going to see evidence of that very often on the bones. I'm just going to end the talk by very briefly sort of giving an overview of some of the work that the team now is doing on the, the wooden spears themselves, the double pointed stick, and um, all these hundreds of wet wood fragments that are still unconserved. Um, so we're taking a kind of um, cultural biography approach to these remains and trying to understand the entire history of the tool, where the wood came from and how it was selected, um, how it was chopped down or, or removed from the tree if it was a branch, um, how it was manufactured, and then how it might have been used, what sort of signs of use we might see, then what happens to the tools after they get buried and excavated and conserved. So um, what we might call in archaeology a, a chaîne opératoire approach, this really understanding the whole life of, of each tool. So my colleagues and I are taking a bunch of, of different analytical approaches, um, including, for example, um, looking at the, the year rings of, of the tools can help us um, understand how the wood was growing, what sorts of conditions it might have grown in, um, and we can also look by looking at, at the, the year rings and where they might be cut, uh, how much of the wood was being removed by the humans when they were making them. We can see some traces on many of the tools, providing the condition of the wood is good enough to preserve these marks that they were worked by humans. And looking at these marks 
um, as we do both with the, the naked eye and with um, microscopy, uh, we can start to understand the process of manufacturing and uh, the types of tools uh, as well. Um, some evidence from the experimental work uh, also helps us to understand what the breaks might look like from use um, and other types of, of signs of use like polish and things like this. So this is really important to have experimental work because this, this is the main way in which we can um, evaluate the use of these tools. 3D digital microscopy by my colleagues Tim Kottenberg at Göttingen, University of Göttingen, and Jens Lehmann are really looking in great detail at thing, features like the knots and how they were worked down, um, and looking at the profiles of things like cuts and stuff like that so that we can understand, again, this manufacturing process. And finally, state-of-the-art CT scanning of the pieces um, is giving us new perspectives on the internal features of the objects. Again, of course, this helps us better understand the growth characteristics of the wood, but it also clarifies the aspects of manufacturing taken by the humans who made these tools. I will just end by mentioning that, of course, the spears and many other wonderful artifacts are on display at the museum in Schöningen, where excavations and world-class research is also being undertaken to continue to interpret this incredible archaeological site. And if you have not been to this museum, I strongly encourage you to go. It's a wonderful set of exhibits um, and really is well worth a visit. Many thanks for listening. <laughs>